if I were born 10 years later, you know, but for the grace of God, there's no doubt in my mind that I would have transitioned. I got really involved in like feminism about like 10 odd years ago. I think what sucked me into it in the first place was this kind of revelation of like everything is a socially constructed. And it became quite clear to me that it's just like, no, that's not the case. The fact that I was autistic getting diagnosed was what helped me. Th there is there is a link. I think it's something like 40% of yeah, girls yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. who transition are autistic. Yeah, yeah. Why are we I not mean, talking about this? Letting children do whatever they want is not kind. No, and it might make you feel like you're doing the kind thing and the whole of society can tell you it's kind. But what we're doing now is like the least kind thing <laughs> that could ever be done to children. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissing. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our fantastic guest today is somebody you have not seen on the podcast circuit. She is in fact the first person that we ever hired to work with us here at Trigonometry. She edits most of the videos that you guys see. And she has a very interesting story to tell about some of the things that we talk about regularly on the show. Sophie Spittle, welcome to Trigonometry. <laughs> Thank you, it's nice to be here. Bit weird, but yeah. <laughs> Bit weird to be on the, on the other side yeah, of the camera. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's great to actually have this conversation. You've been building up to it for a long time. We'll yeah. get into the stuff that you want to talk about and we want to ask you about. Before we do though, what has been the journey that's taken you to be sitting here? Because you were the first person we hired, as I said. Uh, you emailed us saying, hey, do you, you know, are you looking for anybody? And it kind of took off from there. But how, what's been your journey through life? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I come from uh, Chelmsford in Essex. That's where I was born. Uh, I moved to Brighton, uh, which is, um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's like the Portland, Oregon of the UK. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very progressive place. Um, I got really involved in like feminism about like 10 odd years ago um, because I was trying to do the right thing uh, at the time it was it was that kind of um liberal feminism of that sort of intersectional it's totally different from the feminism and then she that. met us <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah so i was really involved with that um and i would have considered myself at that point woke like i actually like i found diary stuff from that time and i actually did call myself woke it's like not a pejorative just like actually you know and i was proud of it and i was very like into that progressive stuff and then well, long story short on that one, I, I got very disillusioned with it when I saw that it didn't actually marry up with like reality and uh, that it was a bit, there were some good good seeds, seeds of truth in there, but I moved away from that. Um, but I was really, really passionate about the truth and doing the right thing and doing what's good and right in the world. Um, and, and that's kind of why I never really kind of make fun of or you know, I don't think people are stupid on the other side because I'm like, I know a lot of them are really well-meaning and a lot of them they just they want to be they want to do the moral right thing in their lives and th that was what was giving me at the time um anyway so I, <laughs> I then I got um really into listening to uh Douglas Murray he was the gateway drug to um uh basically leaving behind a lot of the leftism that I had at the time I was really passionate about um yeah getting to the truth and I, and I just saw these people that a lot of people have been on the show um, speaking this truth that I realised just wasn't wasn't marrying up with what people said about what these people are like these people are evil racist bigots and I was like well if I actually listen to what they say that's not the case and so I kind of flipped from being on the far left to being um, well not on the far right but yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I like that analogy yeah. and yeah. onto the uh, legitimate right um, and then I, I'm a bit I'm a bit like that I go to extremes and I've been finding 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 my place on on that stuff anyway but then so I started listening to a lot of this stuff and then um, I found trigonometry um, in during the lockdown actually the first lockdown. Um, and I was just like, someone said, my friend Ruth was like, oh, just check this out. I think you'll like this. And I looked through the feed and I was like, oh my gosh, it's like all the people I love and listen to. And so um, got got hooked on that. And then I messaged you guys being like, you know, hey, can is there anything I can do to help? And unbeknownst to me at that time, young sweet Anton, who's the producer, um, was completely um, inundated with stuff. And, and that, so I, I stepped in and 
pretty much took over from there. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely did. And look, actually, the thing that we want to talk to you about isn't wokeness necessarily. No, no, not at all. But I was curious that you said that you were... Obviously, we've talked about this before. She's spilling water on herself. <laughs> Spilt yeah. coffee and classic soda. Um, yeah. You were talking about the fact that you were in this kind of liberal feminist mindset. Yeah. And then you mentioned that it didn't marry up to reality, which is what sort of shook you out of that to some yeah. extent. Yeah. W what was it that made you think that it didn't marry up to reality? Like what were some of the conf the clashes between reality and ideology yeah. that you experienced? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, there was a lot of stuff like, I think what sucked me into it in the first place was this kind of revelation of like everything is a socially constructed so for example you, you look at things people come to you and they say um well why do we have blue as the boy color and pink for the girl color and you go oh yeah they're just arbitrary colors they you know but we've assigned this to them and then a lot of stuff was you see stuff and i still see it online about like children's clothes and it's like all the boys clothes are like building and fighting and you know triumphing all the girls clothes are like be kind you know be sweet lovely um, and at the time, the narrative was everything is socially constructed. So there's no difference between men and women at all. It's literally just how we socialise them in society. And I've really bought into that, even to the extent where I didn't believe that there was such thing as someone being subjectively beautiful. Like I remember arguing with someone being like, oh, you only think she's beautiful because, you know, you've been socialised that way and all this kind of stuff. Really? <laughs> yeah, legitimately. Um, so I was like online in... in um, line with the thinking you're even like the kind of thinking you see now which is like no disrespect but people being like obese with a shaved head and like loads of piercings but saying like i'm uh, i'm a 10 and i'm just as attractive as this person you just don't understand it because you've been you know anyway but uh, but the crack so, so sorry to interrupt yeah. you know what that makes your point so well about you know the people on the other side if there is such a thing yeah uh are not stupid because you're an incredibly smart person uh and what well, you're very intelligent, but for you to believe something that factually incorrect is yeah. quite incredible, right? Because our standards of beauty are based on biology yeah. and yeah, you know, exactly. hip ratio and yeah, yeah. all of that, Symm right? Symmetry and all of that. Yeah. So it's it's so interesting that that y you could have been yeah. persuaded to think that. Yeah. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, <clears throat> I'm a bit of an all or nothing person, mm -hmm. and so when I was saw the seed of this, I jumped into it and I started seeing everything through that lens. And actually, um, quite quickly, um, because I went into it full throttle, like I, I saw the, the faults in it very quickly as well. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's just like, it, it's a sort of a, a blessing and a curse because it, it kind of means that I can throw myself into something and I can be in it, like fully in it and then see the problems like very quickly as well. Um, but yeah, so I started to see how this just doesn't marry up with reality. And I started to understand, well, actually... You know, there are reasons. I started learning a little bit more about the differences, like, between men and women, like, neurologically um, and, you know, in terms of our bodies and everything. And it, it became quite clear to me that it's just like, no, that's not the case. And again, even with the thing about, as I said, school, uh, sorry, not school, clothing in, like, shops, it's the message that you get at the time was, you know, boys and girls are blank slates and we've socialised girls to be into flowers and pretty things and, and the boys into these things. But the reality is, is that the market is following the response. The market isn't interested in like churning out like strong boys and, and weak girls or whatever. The market is just following what people like. And yes, there is probably an element, well, there's definitely an element of um, girls get socialised into it because that's the majority thing. But it's also like the reason that, you know, if they started, you know, putting loads of, um, if they put them boys clothes stuff on a lot of the girls clothes stuff, um, you know, when they're old enough to choose their own, they're not going to choose it. They are, the girls are more likely to choose the the kind of princess dress over the Spider-Man outfit, like, uh, you know, most, most girls. Um, so, yeah, I just realised it's, it's, it's more complicated than that, than what I'd initially thought. And there are other things, but yeah. Sophie, you've always been a fascinating person to me. Cheers, darling. <laughs> but genuinely, you have. And one of the things that I really enjoy talking with you yeah. about with you is autism mm. and you being neurologically atypical. When yeah. did you realise that you were autistic and you saw the world in a different way? Yeah. Well, that was 
around, well, actually, I, al- I always kind of knew it because I had sensed it in many ways. Actually, funnily enough, a lot of the things I've discovered about autism, I had no idea were connected to autism at the time when I got diagnosed. So I was diagnosed when I was 25. So that's, um, so that's 2015. It's not actually, um, it's not actually that uncommon to get diagnosed that late in life, you know, for, for most girls. Actually, is, that's changed now because people are thinking about it a lot more. But most women who are diagnosed were diagnosed in adulthood because they, manif- they manifest differently in terms of the boys tend to kind of act out and have meltdowns and are very, like, explosive in school. And the girls are just kind of like, I like rules and just, like, mm-hmm. working and, and, like, high achievers. And so I was like that. I was like that all the way through school. It's like achievement, you know, and I did my school my you know college uni and then um but the problems didn't really arise until after uni because um everything up until that point was very structured um and then you finish uni and it's like I literally have the entire world of choices and I don't know what to do and like the paralysis of that um and other problems that I had with not being able to respond to change uh, executive functioning skills so life management skills um just got me to a place of complete um, breakdown, really. Like I literally, like just not not being able to function in the world, and I was very ashamed of that because I, at the time I didn't know it was autism. So I just thought, I don't get it. Like I'm really high achieving and get, get high grades and you know a good degree and everything, but I can't like do the washing up and I was you know and a lot of that's through sensory issues and, and as well. Um, but yeah, so there was a lot of shame that I had attached to that and for other reasons, which we'll, we'll go into, but, but yeah, the, the warning signs were always there, but it is the black and white th- thinking and the kind of really extreme thinking, um, you know, which you know, leads you to sometimes call me an extremist, <laughs> which is fair. <laughs> but also as well, I mean, you tell that story from your PE lesson and obviously tell it because you're going to tell it a lot better than me when it comes to identification and gender ID. So yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so another uh, part of um, my experience. Let's just set the context a little bit. So yeah, yeah, sorry go for to it. interrupt go for because it. I think the issue that we've talked a lot about on the show, as you well know, mm. oh. uh, is how, I, de- I mean, and this is why I asked you about wokeness because it, it just shows you how ideology is so powerful. Yeah, for real. That it can convince you, even a very smart person like you and like me and like everyone really, of things that are just patently not true. Yeah. But ideology is a very powerful thing. And one of the things we've talked a lot about on the show is the the rise in transgenderism and young children in particular identifying out of their gender and so on. Yeah. How that marries up to, you know, a lot of the other stuff, particularly in relation to autism. I mean, there's there's a yeah. clear link between yeah, yeah, yeah. people who are autistic and people who are transitioning. And a lot of people essentially are making the argument that the overwhelming majority of the increase in recent years is um, basically autistic and gay children. Yeah sort of looking for an answer to why they're different yeah. and ending up in this new thing. Yeah. And the reason we wanted to have you on is that that is actually, to some extent, your experience. Yeah. So yeah. tell us tell us that yeah, now, yeah, now yeah. that we've said that. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird that I'm about to tell my story to however many people. <laughs> but, two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two, yeah, the cameras are off. Um, yeah, I, I, I always experienced thinking that I was a boy from a young age. Um, And it's hard to explain what that means because it's like, what what does that mean? Um, Like, and it wasn't that I wanted to be a boy or or like I was telling people I'm a boy, I'm actually a boy. I actually genuinely thought I was um, because, and and, and I didn't realise that I was a girl until something would come along and remind me. So I think what you were referring to, maybe Francis was, yeah, like I think when I was in assembly in primary school, so I don't know how old I was, maybe like five or something. Um, and the teacher asked us, asked every, well, no, sorry, the teacher asked the boys specifically a question and I started answering. And I just remember the boys next to me being like, why are you answering? You're a girl. And I was like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm a girl. Yeah, good, yeah, got to remember that. Got to remember that. Um, and it was kind of like that all the way, like I default into th- thinking that I was male and that other people saw me as male. Um, and that carried on all the way through my life, really, pretty much, until 
well, until some stuff happened later that, you know, has alleviated that. But, but yeah, like I had that all the time, like, um, and even when I was like 25, like, um, my friends, um, I had my hair cut and my friends were like, oh, you know, you should get some lipstick. Um, cause at the time I, I, I don't think I'd really worn makeup apart from when I'd been forced to for a special occasion, mm. but, um, I didn't like, you know, girls stuff at all. I was completely like, I was just always with the boys and I was just a massive tomboy and I didn't like that stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> my friends were like, oh, let's get you some lipstick. And they sort of marched me down to boots. And uh, I mean, obviously I love lipstick now. <laughs> you can see, it, I love it now. Like I, it's actually, it's quite fun. It's like a little sort of coloring in book at the start of the day, every day, mm. which is fun for me. But like the, <laughs> we went there, they, they put the lipstick on me and I just genuinely felt like, just really like ashamed because I just felt well I felt like a clown first of all um and then when I walked home wearing the makeup I was just like expecting everyone to look at me like you know like you know because I thought that they were seeing a man the way people might look yeah. at a man wearing yeah. obvious yeah. makeup yeah exactly yeah. Mm. and I thought that they was they would see a man walking down the street in drag so I thought I'd draw like you know stairs but then I had to remind myself, oh no, you're a woman. And so they're seeing a woman wearing lipstick, which is normal for them. And so like, and that was, as I say, when I was 25 before I was diagnosed. So um, that was kind of my story all the way through life. And and it wasn't the done thing back in those days to, especially not for girls, to um, do anything about it because you don't, you just, you just say, I'm a tomboy and I'm comfortable with these things. And I just carry on. Also, there's no... Like the reason why um, up until very recently with the whole explosion of girls identifying as trans, it was pretty much all boys. And I think the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is that there's no socially safe way for a boy to sort of um, gender bend, as it were. Like for me, I just wore shorts and mm. T-shirts and whatever. So I could wear boys' clothes, but it didn't look like I was cross-dressing. Whereas if you're a little boy and you, you hate being a boy and you want to be a girl, you know, you, you'll start wearing dresses and then, you know, you're going to very quickly, it's going to be evidence to everyone around you that there's some incongruity going on there. And Sophie, did, did you feel, apart from this one instance with the makeup, did, did, did this cause you particular distress? Did you feel a sense of discomfort or disgust for your own body, which is what some people talk about? Yeah. Um, well, actually, interestingly, I feel like the pressure almost like in, t in terms of fitting with the narrative is to say, yeah, I, I really you know, had a problem <laughs> with my body. I actually, I actually didn't. I had because when you, when you don't have a choice to opt out of your gender, as so many teenagers are given the choice now, you just get on with it. And, you know, realistically speaking, there's not too many moments in one's life where your sex actually comes into play. And so, you know, you learn to use the bathroom with this symbol on it, mm -hmm. the, the lady symbol. Um, and that's it, really. And, and when people set, referred to me as a woman, it was just a little reminder, oh, yeah. I mean, it, there was a bit of a, there was, it did hurt not being able to join in with the boys. Mm -hmm. And like, so I explain, when I talk about gender dysphoria now, which is what it is, you know, it's the... It's defined as the persistent discomfort and distress associated with your, your sex. I think that's the right definition. Um, when I, yeah, when I experience that, I talk about it in, in terms of like two separate categories. There's, there's the actual thinking I was a boy and then there's the wanting to be. So as I, the wanting to be wasn't there when I was young, but when I got older and I would have a reminder that I'm a woman, I would then have feelings of oh, my life would be so much better if I were a man and everything would be, I don't know, like I just got really annoyed with the seemingly arbitrary things that were foisted on me as a girl to, to, that seemed to be valuable to other people, like in terms of looking after your appearance or whatever, like, um, <laughs> I mean, like, I have to wash my face every morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but seriously, it's just like, I mean, like, I didn't, like, wash my hair, do my hair. And I've talked about it before, and I feel, I think my mum feels quite bad about it. But 
and you know she basically said to me I, when I was like 13 or something like you need to start washing your hair and if you don't wash your, your hair like I will cut the whole lot off and because it had genuinely got to the stage of being like matted and horrible and and I was just so not bothered about that stuff mm. and I saw it as such a waste of time and such a stupid imposition that I just I just couldn't care less. Anyway, she did cut all my hair off. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a woman of her word. She was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she feels bad about that um, because she thinks people will think that, you know, that she's an evil mother. But I think it was the right thing to do, to be honest, because it did make me buck up my ideas a little bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so so there, there were, um, sorry, there were like uh, those those feelings. But I think one of the interesting things is I see a lot of people who are, going through gender dysphoria online, talking about their hatred for their bodies. But I was different in that I I never thought about my body. Like, I don't think I realised I had a body till I was like 23 or something, um, which is obviously that's a little bit um, exaggerated because, of course, you know you have a body. But what I mean is I never thought about it. Like, you know, I probably thought about my body about as much as you think about your capillaries. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I know they're there or or maybe like choose something that you can actually physically see, like, I don't know, the crook of your elbow or something. It's like, I know it's there, I can see it, but I never think about it. And I didn't think about, um, yeah, so I, I actually, you know, contrary to, yeah, what a lot of people kind of experience with their sort of hatred of the body, I was just completely disassociated from it. And I actually, so I had the blessing of never being in any way dissatisfied with my body because I just never thought about it. So I was, I was just like, it's working, it's functioning, it's fine. Do you think that's part of the problem now is because of social media and gender ideology that kids are now being encouraged and in fact could be argued manipulated into an obsession with their own bodies? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like, I'm showing my age, but we didn't really have social media when I was growing up, <laughs> back in the day. Um, She's yeah. impersonating us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we didn't really have social media. So it was, there wasn't that fixation on, on, I mean, girls around me were always kind of, uh, you know, especially in school, the girls were like, you know, doing their hair and makeup and stuff. But I mean, I actually, yeah, I, I think I, I developed quite a lot of, um, sexism really against women because of, because of that, because I didn't understand the value of it. And I... Yeah, I, the do you think they were vain or something? Yeah, yeah. Like I, I had a, I had, when I was working through. So I, obviously, w w we will come to like how, because you know, basically there was an alleviation of my gender dysphoria, um, due to. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. But, but yeah, I realised that because of the autism and my black and white way of thinking, there just wasn't any space for like. Um, there wasn't any space for nuance. Autists don't do nuance. Mm. I mean, I try really hard to do it now because like I care so much about the truth and the truth is nuanced. And so you have to, like I have to actively go against <laughs> type to really, really work on that because it's important to me. But I basically just looked at the girls, were like, like, you know, why would you rather play with a Barbie than an action man? An action man abseils and shoots missiles and you know does cool stuff you know rock climbing and wow and and the barbie is literally just standing there with like a mirror and i was just like <laughs> and so it blew my mind that other girls would choose this and you know like now as i say with a bit of nuance i understand that you know dolls and things like that are very good like um social tools for learning many things as um and they're very very useful and there's nothing wrong with choosing a barbie but at the time, I just had so much disdain for girls. And that made me disassociate even further to the point where I didn't even consider myself one of them. And so I had, when I was working through trying to get over my gender dysphoria, I met with one of the um, pastors of my church, um, Stephen, and he, he and I were talking about it. And I was like, oh, like, what? I don't want to be a woman. W women are so... Um, boring and just airheaded and all they care about is their appearance and you know like and I'm I'm really like um passionate about like philosophy and 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 history and all these important intellectual things and you know and they're just what they they're just not on my level and, and he was like 
yo, you're being really sexist. <laughs> you need to repent. Um, <laughs> genuinely. And I was like, that just really hit me because I was just like, yeah, I am. I'm being sexist. And what I'd done is I'd conflated all of the worst things I'd seen about um, this sort of picture of femininity I built up in my mind to almost make an enemy. So if you've got an enemy, you can run away from it or fight it or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I just realised that, I mean, obviously that was sexist. And I'm, and I'm being a bit over the top about it. But so, but yeah, I had to work through that because mm. I realised that there's just so many, that's so not true. And like some of the things that I had a problem with are just women just being women in the same way that a lot of people have problems with the things that are masculine. And it, they, they're just, you know, it's just men being men a lot of the time. And it's mm. like, it's not, it's just, it's just that I was an outlier on the bell curve, that I resented that. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Constantine, what's the best thing about having this episode sponsored by BetterHelp? In my country, mental health is something that you have before you start drinking. Thankfully, we start drinking at breakfast, so we have no problem. Really? Yes. Our slogan is, drink breakfast vodka and become real men. Okay. But if you do want to feel better inside and out, then maybe you should try better help. I have been doing therapy for over a year, and it has really helped me understand myself better and become far more effective in both my work and my personal life. I always knew you were not a real man. Pass me the vodka. Therapy has helped me transform myself so that I take responsibility for my behavior and my attitude. You can't achieve your dreams if you don't think you deserve to. Every shot you drink make you feel stronger. What is problem? And the great thing about BetterHelp is that it's all online and they can connect you with a licensed therapist who can work with you so that you can achieve your goals. It takes a few minutes to set up and it can fit around your schedule. I will never forget my first love, Olga Orgazmachenko, and the beautiful relationship that could have been. And if it's not working for you with a particular therapist, then you can always switch at no extra charge. I am doomed to become a Russian poet. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash trigger today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash trigger. <sighs> I have run out of breakfast vodka. It's time for lunchtime brandy. So can we come back chronologically a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Because um, one of the narratives in the modern world mm. is that a lot of uh, young people experience all of these sort of feelings and thoughts mm. around puberty because that's when the shock of reality of their biology comes in. Yeah. Uh, I know it's an intimate question, but I think it's relevant to this yeah, conversation. Yeah, sure, sure. You would have gone through, did that not have an impact well, on- Puberty? Yeah. Literally not at all. Like, I don't remember when I started my period. I don't remember my body changing. I don't really, really literally, I couldn't give you any insight into that That's at all. That's so interesting. It was like, yeah, I, I have not one memory of thinking that. That is fascinating. That is so interesting. I think I noticed, I think once when I was in PE, when I was in high school, I noticed that, that I had hair on my legs for the first time. That's the only memory I have. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, moving on then. <laughs> <laughs> from the hairy legs conversation. Uh, I'm just curious to, uh, to, to talk about the link with autism. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. this is something you've done a lot of, looking into For real. how how do these things connect yeah yeah well this is the thing i think a lot of people uh, people know now that it does connect yes. i think several years ago i was tearing my hair out because i was just like finding out about my how the, the the fact that i was autistic getting diagnosed was what helped me to which was which helped me to heal really from gender dysphoria maybe not heal wasn't the right word but like it alleviated it as i understood my autism because it just explained it all. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I was looking into, um, when I found out that I had autism, when I got diagnosed, I started looking into the neuroscience of it because obviously autism is a neurodevelopmental condition. And so I started looking into neurodevelopment. Um, I read this brilliant book by um, 
Professor Sir Simon Baron Cohen of Cambridge University. He's like the he's like the world leading uh, authority on, on autism, really, or one of them. Um, but he's also like um, world leading in uh, cognitive sex differences. So the way men and women's brains work differently. So he's about five minutes away from getting cancelled. That's then. true enough, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was reading his book. He wrote a book called The Essential Difference, which um, if it was brought out, if it were brought out 10 years ago, probably would have been torn to shreds. But it was about, I think it's about 20 years old now. But he basically distills all of the scientific literature on the differences between the way men and women think into this you know, very readable book. And I'd recommend anyone to read it. But... Um, one of the things that I learned in that book um, was um, the differences between men and women in terms of uh, what's called um, empathy, empathizing and systematizing skill sets. Mm -hmm. And so like this is kind of this is just putting a scientific label on what we already know, which is that generally speaking, uh, the majority of men are more interested in things and concepts and systems and like problem solving and that and the majority of women are less interested in that and more interested in uh the kind of um emotional side of life uh, uh relationship building uh, looking after children nurturing um building that kind of thing and so yeah i think summed up really it's that most men are more interested in things and most women are more interested in people and um those those are the bell curves and obviously there's outliers which you know, we'll come back to but anyway so um, then I learned about uh, the extreme male brain theory of autism because the amazing thing that, you know, that, you know, the combining his two fields of autism and cognitive sex differences mm -hmm. is that if you look at the uh, brain of someone with autism, their brain is like an exaggerated version of the male brain, right? So... Um, really high systematizing, really low empathizing. Um, and um, that's that's the same for men and women. I mean, I've got a little graph that I can put up, but it shows the the differences that, you know, th you've got the men and the women. The, the men are less empathic and the women are more empathic, but they're quite similar. And then down the other end, you've got um, really unempathic uh, men and women with autism. Anyway, um Obviously, to learn that the autistic brain is like a male brain on crack, <laughs> you know, started to answer my questions. Because <laughs> I think at that before that, I'd, I'd thought there was something wrong with me. You know, like I, I was, I was deeply ashamed because I, I felt like a failure as a woman before, which was one of the reasons I ran away from it because I had such low levels of empathy. I, I'm in like the second percentile for compassion. <laughs> you know? So, you know, 100 people in a room, there's like one person with less compassion than me. Um, and that's way lower than the average for a male, um, let alone a female. And so I'm a Christian, as you well know, a top level Chriso, as you call me. <laughs> and for me, one of the really important things to do is to love people and to to be loving. And, and I think I... Again, like that's probably why I got involved with feminism because at the time I was like, I want to fight, I want to do the right thing, I want to make the world better for women. Um, but yeah, so this injunction to be loving was so important to me, but I didn't feel loving feelings, right? Because I didn't have these compassionate, empathic feelings. And I was surrounded, particularly in the church, with loads of amazing, um, compassionate, like pastoral women. And they were just... And I just felt nothing, you know. And so I felt really deeply ashamed of that. But then when I, so I thought I was defective. I thought I was a failure, really, as a woman. And then when I started learning about the extreme male brain stuff, I was like, well, like, I'm autistic. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I realised that I was just, um, I wasn't a man, you know. <laughs> I realised that I was a, just a rarer type of woman. Um, and and that was the key, really. That just unlocked everything, you know, because, uh, I mean, it, it was gradual. There was like the key turned and then the door opened really slowly <laughs> um, because I, yeah, I did move quite slowly into appreciating that. But it, it started to explain everything because I was like, well, OK, um, I don't need to 
I, I was I did try. I went for a few years of trying really hard to sort of be what I thought a woman should be. Um, in terms of I, I <laughs> some of it stood me in good stead now in terms of like helping people. But I I, I took a lot of like lessons and, and training and like pastoral care and so like I can. I know the right things to do, like if someone is in distress or like I'm not, you know, if someone is grieving or stuff. So I, I, I've learned actually a lot of practical skills, but it doesn't mean the feelings there. But anyway, um, another one of my elders or, you know, pastors, same thing at church really helped me with that because before I was diagnosed with autism, I went to him and I was saying, you know, I, I feel really bad because I haven't got these loving feelings and I want to be loving and I want to, you know, you know, follow in Jesus' footsteps and, you know, love people. Um, but I don't feel these feelings. And he said, you know, like, um, you know, that he, he basically said, you're um, perhaps you could be the one person in a room where there's like a crisis and everyone else is overwhelmed by their emotions. And, you know, you know, but you can be like, see through it and, you know, be like really um, helpful in that situation and just use your gifts and, um uh yeah that really helped me that really stuck with me because I realized that that yeah I I was I was trying to you know I was trying to be the, the opposite of what I was um and now I see actually that the love primarily isn't about feelings um like any parent knows or you don't have to be a parent, but you were a teacher. Um, I think you mentioned it once or twice. <laughs> um, and also, isn't your mum from Venezuela? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, yeah. What was I saying? So you, you the love isn't necessarily yeah, 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 about yeah, yeah. feelings. It's it, about it, actions, I'm guessing. Well, not even so. necessarily. Like, you can... This is a problem, I think, that we really just kind of messed up with over the last few years that we th we think to be loving to someone is to just go along with everything they want and mm. you know like if you're a loving parent and your child wants like chocolate like just before bedtime or whatever you just say no you can't have that and that's being loving in the moment um and they feel like yo you hate me or whatever like you want me to die or you know and but it's just like you actually know what's best and what you're doing is loving and it, you're the, but I think at the moment we are so. I think that the one of the only values that we that we kind of hold to in this kind of sort of post christian -y sort of fade, failing liberal kind of Western project is one of the only things we have is be kind. We just have to be kind and, and nice, and that's how we know we're good people. And I think because we everyone wants to be good. I think I think most people care about it. They want to be good. They want to be on the right side of history. And what they're told now is the loving, good thing to to be is to be kind, is to be really kind. And so, but it isn't tempered by truth. And, you know, I think, so here's some Chriso stuff, just pre-warning. But like the Bible says of Jesus that he was full of grace and truth. And I think that the Western project has only um, flourished in as much as it's held to those that Christly balance of grace and truth. When I say grace, I, I mean like you know, grace, compassion, mercy, tenderness. Um, we need. It's it's nice to show grace to someone, but you also need to do the right thing and the thing that is true. And your right point is. You. Letting children do whatever they want is not kind. No, and it might make you feel like you're doing the kind thing, and the whole of society can tell you it's kind. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing now is like the least kind thing <laughs> that could ever be done to children. And um, I often think about this with pronouns because, like, um, if I were born 10 years later, you know, but for the grace of God, there's no doubt in my mind that I would have transitioned, that I would have gone the whole hog. And that's the, the thing about autistic people is like, we go the whole hog, you know, like, like if you notice. Yeah, um, just a little bit. It's just like, I got into Star Trek and like two weeks later, I'd bought like a full uniform. Um, and like, that's just, that's just me, but that's just autists. Like, that's what we're like. And, 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 you know, there's some beauty to that and some craziness, but going the whole hog, um, I would have done that with transition. 
I would have had a mastectomy. I would have, you know, it would have been, it just wasn't a solution at the time. But like, I look back at that, I'm just like, I can't believe that, I can't believe that we're going to, we've gotten to a place in society where we think, oh, it's okay, like, that that's the loving thing to do, just give them what they want. Um, when they're children, the literary children, the brain doesn't finish developing until like 25 anyway. Mm -hmm. But to to give, you know, puberty blockers and, and you know, medical intervention to, to children is just like absolutely insane. It's like, how do we get to this place? And I do think it's this lack of, uh, of like truth and like the the value of like f freedom and being loving just didn't seem as the ultimate value. And why do you think as well? Because I think that there must be another reason. I accept your point. I think that's a major part of it. But the link between autism yeah. and gender dysphoria, mm. why is it that we, that we are not looking into that? Mm. Why are we not studying that? Because that, that is... Th there is there is a link. I think it's something like forty percent of yeah, girls yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. who transition are autistic. Yeah, yeah. Why are we I not mean, talking about this? The the the, the the figures are scary. Like the Tavistock, like the CQC report on the the Tavistock, mm -hmm. the JIDS clinic for the for child gender uh, transition, um, is like fifty percent had autism or. Um, ADHD, which is very similar in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a report, an article written by two of the previous JIDS members of staff that say that 50% of their, like they did a strategic sort of analysis and 50% of them were autistic. Um, there are so many reasons why it's um, a, such an appealing prospect to autistic people. Um, yeah, one of them is, you know, like obviously on the, the female side of things, you've got that kind of yeah, that neurological shift to the male direction. So, of course, all your interests are going to be similar to your male peers. All of everything you see, like everything that, that's expected of you, which is kind of, again, as I say, it's 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 natural and it's based on the it's based on the majority. Like everything we have in society is based on the majority. So, it's like, um, if you're an outlier, that's that's going to affect you badly. But so uh, I think Francis' question was more about why is it that we don't look at this obvious thing that's staring us in the face yeah, yeah. as a society dealing yeah, yeah, with yeah. this issue. Yeah. And we're not going, well, look, if autism is, let's say, it's a comorbidity, yeah. is that maybe something we should look at? Maybe we should, <laughs> yeah. you know, sort yeah. of think about that? Do you, yeah, think, yeah. Do, you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Um, the only thing I was just going to say about the, uh, the, the other side of it, which is the boys thing, is that because you could say, oh, well, the boys are getting an extreme male brain, so surely they should be more manly. But there's so many other things that come along with autism that are that are going to affect you in terms of your social impairment. Like if you are um, if you're just socially delayed, and and autism is a delaying thing. You know, mm -hmm. like I was like the last in my class to learn to read. I was um, yeah, as I say I didn't know about my body until as you know in my twenties. I I I didn't. Um, yeah, I didn't make a friend until like I was 10 or something. <laughs> um, so um, there's there's that delay. And if you've got that delay and you're, and you're a boy and you're going to be socially less confident as well. And the girls would tend to uh, make friends with you more. Like the autistic guys I know, you know, like they, they most of their friends are girls because they're more accepting of your quirks or your 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 uncoolness or whatever. And it's sort of they take you under their wing in a way. Um and so you, you kind of get on the boy side. Um, why don't we recognise it as a problem in society? I mean, we are saying, oh, it's one of the many comorbidities. You say, oh, you know, a lot of people um, who are transgender, they are some, you know, a lot of them are, you know, ADHD or a lot of them have autism. But it's just like we have totally neglected to understand that there's a difference between having a comorbidity and something being the cause of something. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, there was a study in 2019 um, that, sh that showed that of, um, what was it, of those who identified as trans and non-binary, 42% met the criteria for an autism di diagnosis. Um, and, you know, obviously the normal rate of autism in the general population is about 2%. So, um, and Dr. Stagg, who led the study, was like, 
you know, I don't know if he was a, a whistleblower, so to so speak, more probably just following the outcome of his study, but it was just like, we need to be screening people for autism, anyone who comes in to ask about gender stuff. And the, yeah, as I say, the tragic thing is that we haven't looked into it, but I, I think I know the reason why we've been so rubbish at looking into um, all of the comorbidities and problems and causes. I mean, like, if you look at the, like, the stats on the Tavistock from Hannah Barnes' book, um, Time to Think, which is an excellent piece of journalism, um, the stats are just terrifying. It's like 2.5% or something of the intake didn't have any kind of major, like, um, issue with, uh, like, abuse or, um, uh, yeah, neurodivergence or... Uh, I think 25% of them had been in care comp compared to 0.67% of the population. Mm. Like the, a lot of them had, had, had they were like 10 times more likely to have experienced um, abuse, like sexual abuse, I think. Um, there are all these things like there's self-harm, there's OCD, there's, there's all these different things and they weren't looked at, but I think I know the reason. <laughs> um, and the reason is like, well, I, I split society, I split life as we know it, history mm. into two eras. So I think there's the era of old trans and the era of new trans. And the era of old trans goes up to about 2017, I'd say, around that period. And then new, the era of new trans is everything after that. And these are two wildly different uh, ways of looking at uh, the trans experience. So up until 2017, um, the way that we thought of the trans experience was... Like if you, it wouldn't have been like, because I lived in Brighton, as I say, I live in Brighton and you would sometimes see a fella in a dress 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And, but if you'd spoken to him at the time, you said like, um, oh, you know, why are you, why are you wearing a dress? He might say, well, I know I'm a man, but like, I feel more comfortable in women's clothes and I've always related to women and I always, you know, I've always identified with women. Um, but then when this shift happened around 2017, people went from saying that they identify with women to I identify as a woman. And so we went from saying, I feel like something to I am something. And the repercussions of that, that little shift affect literally everything. Like it, it is all, the entire problem that we have now is all down to this shift and I can give you myriad examples but like the so I mean we had Marcus Evans on the show a whistleblower from the Tavistock he'd been there for like 35 years um you know consultant psych psychotherapist I think and he said you know like in the old days you know before this big shift and everything if someone comes in saying you know I'm really distressed you know like I, I feel like trapped in the wrong body or whatever the treatment pathway for them was exploratory therapy so it's like um let's look at your life in the round let's look at um you know your relationship with your parents relationship with your peers um has there been any abuse any trauma um what are your expectations of what it actually means to be a man or a woman in the world what, you know talk us through that um and all these different things and they explore those things but when this new kind of way of thinking of saying it's your identity and it's who you are rather than just feelings that you have came in. You can't do that anymore because if your gender is who you are um, and you, you, it's not that you feel like a boy. You, you can't treat boy. something that you yeah. are. Yeah, quite. Yeah. I mean, if it's like because it, it, it would be transphobic. It'd be like or it'd be like someone with Down syndrome going into the doctor. They, they don't try to cure your down syndrome or don't try and cure you of being black it's just like <laughs> do you know what i mean <laughs> like um because it's, it's that would be yeah. Yeah. yeah well no, no it's not even your identity it's who you are it's, who you are. it's right. intrinsic to your so this is the thing so like there's in the old days it was seen as again the reason i'm giving this 2017 cutoff point is because uh something strange happened there i think it might be to do with people needing to shore up their sense of being a good person in the wake of Brexit and Trump, very, very polarising year 2016, and people were desperate to kind of 
I think, know, convince themselves and others that they were on the right side. And this was the thing that came along. And and you have certain things that came along around that time, like India Willoughby, former guest of the show, was on Celebrity Big Brother in 2018. I'm a real woman, Amanda. I want you to know that. Yes, a real darling. woman. Okay, I'm yes. glad that's sinking in. I'm going to say it one more time so it really penetrates. Yes. I am a real woman, okay? I and then obviously around that time, you see the emergence of the phrase like trans women are women. And, and so, and in fact, if you think about it, when was the last time you heard someone say, I identify as a woman? They don't do it anymore. They don't even say that anymore. So, it, so it, the identifies you women dropped. So, so now it's, it's who you are. And as I say, so once, yeah, I thought, so when I read Time to Think, the, the book about the Tavistock, I thought, I had this idea in my head that the kids are coming along to the Tavistock, being referred, and there must be some, like, it, it can't just be that they rubber stamp them and said, oh, you know, puberty blockers. There's adults in the room. It's all not the way that people say in the media. I, it's all being properly I, looked and into. And you would think that because you're like, this is a place of clinicians. It's on the NHS. It's, yeah. it's being overseen. There's no way. And you read the book and you're like, oh, Flip, it actually was like that. Like, mm -hmm. there was so much intervention from, from, like, mermaids and other, like, politicised bodies and such a culture of fear um, that they were literally just being like, okay, uh, the, well, they had this thing called, this th model called gender affirming care, mm. which is, um, you know, an Orwellian sort of a, a twisting of words, really, because, you know, it's like, you know, the, to really affirm someone it would be to say you're, you're brilliant just the way you are and you don't need to change, and you don't need to try and fit into these sex stereotypes and, you know, you go for it. But anyway, so this affirming care, which comes in with this idea of it's who you intrinsically are, um, that just made everything a problem. It sort of solidified it and it became the gold standard, not just the gold standard of care, but like the American Psychological Association and all these top bodies said, this is the way to care. And if you're not doing that, if you're just exploring it, like in the old days, you're kind of casting down their problems. Uh, uh, sorry, you're casting down their identity and who they intrinsically are. And it's not that they've got a problem. They've just discovered the truth of who they are. Um, and But but this, this problem, this shift from I feel like to I am, this old trans way of thinking and this new trans way of thinking has affected everything else as well. So it's not just, um, you know, autistic and gay and other vulnerable children being um, treated because of this. Um, you know, in my mind, a massive medical scandal um, and uh, medical neglect. But it's also, um, we see it in every area, like in terms of women's spaces, um, because it's, again, it's like old trans, you've got a man who... You know, he feels like a woman, he feels comfortable in women's clothes, fine, but he's not going in the women's change rooms because he's not entitled to, he's not a woman. But now it's like, well, he is a woman and therefore, you know, he's entitled to that, that space. And this is why, this is why I think people, a lot of people just think, I don't get this trans argument, like, why can't we just live and let live and why can't they just reconcile? Because it can't be reconciled. It's a conflict yeah. of rights. Yeah. It's a conflict of rights. And so the only way that we can deal with these problems is by going back just a few years ago, just what, like seven, eight years ago, whatever, to, you know, live and let live, wear what you want, call yourself what you want. Like, that's fine. I don't mind. I don't care. Like, no one cares how someone dresses and chooses to live there, you know, express themselves. But I'm sorry, we can't overreach into the area of you actually are this. And we're just, um, but this is, this is, this is the great news because um, as I said before, like the, I think the trans experiment has failed because we are seeing all these dominoes fall when people are suddenly realizing that the negative results of what's happened. Hey KK, do you believe in spring cleaning? Yes, but only when my wife does it. In Russia, men who clean are executed for not being real men, which is correct. Well, for those men who are living in the 21st century, Manscaped has an incredible offer for you. Manscaped are the global leaders in men's below the waist grooming and have forever changed the grooming game with their amazing performance package 4.0. Inside this care bundle, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0 
trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop <laughs> reviver toner, <laughs> performance boxer brief, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. This elite trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. Although your wearables might look like a couple of Boris Johnsons, treat them with respect and benefit from their proprietary skin safe technology. Complete your grooming game this spring with the new refined cologne signature scent by Manscaped. This stuff is legit and will have you smelling like royalty. The good kind, not Prince Andrew. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. It's time to throw out all your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life. People are suddenly realizing the, the negative results of what's happened because um, it started, as I say, 2017, 18, started building up online. Then we go into lockdown. Everyone's in their homes or online for a few years. The real world implications of this new trans worldview aren't manifested. We come out of lockdown. We try to apply those, that, that new way of thinking in the real world. And it's an absolute <laughs> catastrophe <laughs> in so many areas. And so you see people starting to backtrack and, and like, so in the f last few months, we've seen like, in terms of women's sports, mm -hmm. we've seen great like changes in that, in terms of like world athletics, like world cycling, world aquatics, pardon me, all deciding, you know, look, we, we, we want to be nice, but at the end of the day, we do have to, to recognize that your bodies, you know, are different. This I'm talking about male athletes. Mm -hmm. And so they've said, look, we don't want to discriminate, but we are going to, have an open category. So it's going to be female category and an open category. So um, the, you know, the dominoes, dominoes have started to fall in the sports area. Um, you know, we've seen public backlash to the gender self ID stuff, like in terms of the double rapist that was put in a woman's prison um, uh, in Scotland, you know, caused this great you know, people didn't realise this was going on. And again, even someone like me, who's really involved in it, I still had to say, I need to check the sources here and make sure that this is actually happening. Are actually men being placed in women's prisons? Because I thought, no, it sounds like a sort of Daily Mail made up thing. No disrespect to the Daily Mail. But, you know, it sounds like one of these sort of like... I think there's yeah. quite a lot of disrespect <laughs> to the Daily Mail. Okay, sorry, sorry Daily Mail. But, um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It sounds yeah. like a sort of like, they're putting men in women's... But they actually are, like, around the world, and they have been doing so. And and so there's been pushback on that. This um, rapist has been moved out of the women's prison, and that's, you know, people are calling for more of that. That's taking a turn. That's taking a tumble. Um, then you've got, like changing rooms and stuff like Primark instituted gender neutral uh, changing rooms. And then, you know, surprise, surprise, people are coming on, you know, TikTok. Saying, Sophie, do, and, and I think you're making great points, by the way. For real. You know, and what you're saying is, is true. But don't you think this says something deeper about society as a whole? Yeah. That we as a society have come undone from our moorings, so to speak. Yeah. Where we will say things like her penis yeah. and no one bats an eyelid. Yeah. I mean, to put it bluntly, that is mental. Yeah. The thing is, I understand why you say it's mental, but I don't actually think it is mental because I think if you do, if you, like as I said, when I was a feminist before, if you accept that everything is a construct and everything is up for being constructed, then, because what they've done is they've said, we're going to expand the categories of, of, of the word man, man and woman. Mm -hmm. They're not saying, I think people think, oh, someone's saying that someone can become the opposite sex. They're not saying that. They're literally just saying that the word woman used to be, you know, like hogged by biological women. And now we're expanding it to what it truly should be, which is to include, you know, uh, uh, women biological women and men who want to be women or have called themselves that. I think the big problem here comes from the invention of the concept of gender itself. Well, yeah. Um, feminists don't like hearing this because they're the one that popularized this yeah. aspect of it. But um, it was kind of created as a way of being able to opt out of femininity. Mm. Uh, so that you could say, well, I am a woman, 
but I'm not going to behave in the stereotypical ways that women are expected to behave. And I understand the need, or at least the desire, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but if you invent the concept of gender, everything else follows. Uh, gender isn't a word that applies to human beings. I mean, animals don't have gender, yeah. right? And n neither do human beings. But once you create the idea that you can, you, there can be a difference between your sex and this other thing, yeah. this is where you end up inevitably, yeah. which is why you say it makes perfect sense, because it makes perfect it sense. It does make perfect sense. Because if you have gender, then a woman can have a penis. Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. And so this is why I say to people, because I, I do speak about this stuff, and, and I try and help people to understand it, and I say, like, I, ne I don't use the word gender because it means different things to different people, but also because of what you said. And I say to people, when you hear the word gender, just replace it with feelings because <laughs> because that's what they are like yeah. and so so what i was saying i uh, so it used to be the case that obviously sex and gender were synonymous so if you had a form and it asked you for your gender in the 70s you knew they just meant sex yeah like and so you, you'd write male or female but then as you say like it started to be used in different ways and it started to be talk, talking about your roles and your expression and it's things like that and i think there is some utility to that um but there's also problems with it and then, but now, as I say, like, if you add identity onto it and you're saying it's it's an inherent, like, innate thing about someone that they have an identity, sorry, that they have, like, a, a sort of a gendered soul, as people have talked about, um, then, then, yeah, that, that causes all these problems. And so I was, I was chatting to the, to the boys, uh, the production boys, and I was, I was trying to work this out and I was saying, well, look, if the word gender didn't exist at all, right? But you wanted a word to explain what gender is, which is basically, ultimately, I think it's about your feelings and how you fit in with your sex. That That is it, really, because it is, it's it's dependent on your sex, like, by definition, because it's, it's in relation to your sex. So it's like, um, you know, if you're transgender, the idea is that you... A, there's a, a transition from you know your uh, sex so um so i said like if we didn't have the word gender which is confusing so many people because people think sex gender same thing and we just use the word uh fit thing as in your, how you fit in and feelings mm -hmm. and you just said i have a fitling and everyone has a fitling right okay so, or T, fitling, if you want to pronounce your T's, but I'm from Essex, so I don't pronounce my T's. Um, but yeah, so, and if, and if you said, um, you know, no form is going to ask you for your fitling. Every form is going to ask you if it's relevant for your sex. And the word gender doesn't exist. So, and then you come along and you say, well, you know, I really feel that I have a, a blue fitling or I have a pink fluffy fitling. It's like, okay, that's fine, but it doesn't affect anything. Whereas, you know, if it, I think the reason it's so confusing is that people actually think that because it's the word gender, which they, they know and associate with something that's real in their mind, they can, they sort of, it, I think it confuses a lot of ordinary people that, um, do, do, you, do you see yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I absolutely It'd do. It'd be so see. much easier if we just got rid of the word gender. Well, I know, I know. That we can agree on. That we can agree on. Unfortunately, uh, it's now running rampant, as it were. It is the monster that was created, and now it's running rampant. Yeah. We are starting to see changes, positive changes, I think we can all agree on. What else do we need to do? Because for me, one of the most worrying things as a former teacher, everyone can drink, obviously, is gender-neutral toilets in schools. Mm. And when I saw this come in, my head was in my hands. <laughs> yeah. Because I just thought, these are people who have no understanding about what it is like to be a teenage girl going through puberty and the vulnerability that these people, that these women feel, girls feel. Yeah. Everyone except for me, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, um, I acknowledge that most well, girls feel some kind of vulnerability when yeah. they are in puberty. Um, it's a very good impression of Greta Thunberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we got a lot in common, me and Greta. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. What can be done? Yes. Well, actually, I... While there's a lot of mental stuff going on, mm -hmm. I'm actually incredibly encouraged right now. Um, I don't think, I think, I have a very strong sense that this whole thing is is coming crashing down right now. I mean, 
It's because you haven't been to America. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, joking. fine. I know, I know, I know. So obviously in America it's different. But it's we're, very different. I, I know, and, and they've got this massive profit incentive that we don't have over here, and which is, you know, one of the main reasons why I think that it's it's continuing to go along there. But I think people are starting to push back. And, you know, we are seeing, we've seen so many things. This is like I was talking about these dominoes falling, or if you want to think about it in terms of a Jenga block, you know, like all these things are being pulled out. Like you've got, mm -hmm. yeah, like the Tavistock being closed down and like the massive public shaming of what happened at the Tavistock. And everyone's realizing it's such a, a scandal. And then you've got over a thousand families suing the Tavistock. Mm -hmm. I don't even think, I think it only saw about, 10,000 people in the last five, six years or something. And like a over a thousand families are suing it. And this is Britain. It's like, we're not like in America where they just sue anyone at the drop of a hat. You know, we, we're not a litigious society, but a thousand families suing the, the Tavistock, very public, lots of coverage, you know, like, you know, stories of like, you know, you actually see in mainstream newspapers like the Times and Telegraph, Richie Heron, a detransitioner had his story. Um, out, Kira Bell, like these these things. So that's that's one Jenga block. We've had the the, the self ID gender blocks taken away, but people being like it's mental, mm -hmm. and people normal people being um, mobilised, as it were, to to kind of get together and and say actually we're not we're not having this actually. Um, and yeah, as I say, that then you've got the sports thing, you've got the change rooms. What I was going to say before about Primark is that they so many people came on TikTok being like. So I was just in Primark um, in Cambridge and um, I feel really stupid being emotional about this but um, yeah I was trying on some clothes and it was a unisex changing room which I'm really for and I love that because you know it makes everyone feel included but twice um, two men walked, opened the curtain, walked in on me um, luckily both times I had, I was wearing fully clothed, but I could easily not have been. Um, and I, yeah, it was two different people, um, clearly from the same group. And there was many, like, uh, probably like a hundred changing rooms available. Um, so it's not like, you know, it was like always oh, someone in here or not. It was, you know, clearly. Um, and both times, like, I was so shocked and I was like, oh, sorry. Like, as if it was my fault. Um... But yeah, um, I have to say though, Primark have been amazing. Um, they were really, really good about it. Um, yeah, they have walked me back to my car and everything because I was scared. Um, apparently it's not the first time it's happened and um, security are watching back the tapes and seeing if they can find who it is. But yeah, I just want to say to people, please be careful. Um, and if you go in the changing room, try not go on your own. Um, I will never be doing that again. I would rather take it home, try it on, and then take it back and get refunded. So yeah, stay safe. So many people came on TikTok being like crying and saying, oh, someone was filming me in the, the changing rooms that they did a U-turn and they reinstated, um, you know, gen uh, single sex spaces for changing. All these things are falling into place. And I think we are going to come out of this in almost like a dreamlike state in a few years being like, I can't believe that we let a very, very small minority of incredibly political voices just, yeah, as you say, run rampant. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought, well, you know, they're progressive and we want to be pro progressive and good people. And they seem to know what they're doing and they've got degrees in like gen gender theory and queer theory and stuff. And, you know, um, I want to, you know, you know, I'm a liberal person and, you know, I love gay people and, you know, and I don't care if someone wants to wear a dress. So, you know, people think they outsource their thinking of this and they assume the experts, especially someone like the NHS, they assume that they will be, you know, competent Same. enough. And then you realise, and like you did a brilliant like Twitter thread in the video about like why we've lost trust in institutions. Turns out all these institutions just didn't have you know, the backbone or or, or the, the principles to stand on. And this is why what I said before it comes about back, truth. Well, it comes back to the other thing you said, actually, which is about uh, children, because you talked about how it's all about kindness, but what you didn't mention is as part of the demonization of men, mm. it's not actually about men. It's about what masculinity is. And part of that is strength and authority, which we fear more than anything in mm. modern society. Mm. 
and to exercise strength and authority is seen as, I mean, quoting Jordan Peterson here, but it's seen as automatically being conflated with tyranny, right? And so to say to somebody, well, we understand that you have these feelings, mm. but we are a medical profession. We don't just cut bits off children because it's not what we do, is a sign of ty tyranny. It's a denial of your identity. It's a denial of medical treatment that you need out of the kindness that we're supposed to act with. And so I think part of what you're talking about societally, where this comes from, is an unwillingness of people to essentially be adults. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, I think that something's happened in the millennium generation or slightly before that maybe, where we all kind of communally took a puberty blocker. <laughs> 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 and we literally, like, I think a couple of decades, we just decided, I mean, like, the, the trans-identifying thing is a way of opting out of reality at the end of the day. It's, mm -hmm. it's your, there's something about yourself that you don't like and you're trying to disassociate yourself from it. And I think that's what we've done. I think we've, I think we saw reality like life is difficult. I have to take responsibility. Um, and, but we were given this kind of opt out of adulthood. And, and that's where you get a lot of adolescent, adolescentish men who are kind of your age. Um, <laughs> and you're, you're not in this, this camp at all. But it's like, instead of like, um, instead of uh, the puberty blockers, we've got like porn and just weed and gaming and just casual sex and like all uh, the things we enjoy yeah, <laughs> yeah indeed yeah. <laughs> um, in moderation yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well not at all um, yeah so but you know what I mean it's like we've there's a way you can be that yeah. doesn't require you to grow up and yeah. take responsibility and one of the things about being a man is eventually getting to a point where you have to be the authority and it's yeah. very uncomfortable, yeah. particularly if you haven't been properly socialized to be in that position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know the story because I've told you, but I was dreading hiring, not you specifically, although <laughs> you specifically as well, but just hiring anyone because yeah. I was like, we're going to have to manage this now. Yeah, we don't yeah. really know how. So I know what you mean. So if we're running out of time. So I, before we go to locals and we'll do a good chunk on there for people because your, your story actually raised a lot of interest. Uh, tell us very quickly, <laughs> before we ask the last question, but very quickly about how you got peace with who you are. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I'm just very, very grateful for people in my life who... You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Not you um, Largely Christians, actually, who had what I... Um, talked about that that balance of grace and truth mm -hmm. um you know as a society we can go too far towards you know truth at the expense of of being gracious and um and we have done that in the past and christian societies have done that in the past you know if you look at sort of dickensian britain and you know it's just like you know if the poor would rather do die than they better do it and decrease the surplus pop population mm -hmm. you know um if anyone thinks i'm smart for knowing Dickens that straight from Muppets Christmas Carol <laughs> but do you know what I mean it's like so we have done that and yes. so I'm not saying Christianity is perfect but that's why I'm saying like if you do it right like and so Christians are speaking into my life being like doing what what the gender clinics were doing back in the day which is exploratory therapy and being like okay so there's a reality of who you are and so it so it really helped me to be like so I knew with the help of other people and with the help of the scripture as well, because I that you know it was it's evident to me. There's just no concept of gender identity in the Bible. It's like, you know, you get amazing characters like King, king David, and he was like this amazing king, and he, but he was also like he was a warrior, but he was also uh, a poet and a musician and a, and a harp player. And there's nothing in the Bible about like, well, he was being really manly when he was being a warrior and he was, but he was exploring his feminine inside. It was just like, no, he's just a man. And so like, uh, you know, there, there was that, but the kind of holding on to grace and truth really, really helped me um, to, to come to peace in that because I realized that I was a woman with a mind that was disconnected from reality at times. Um, so a woman. 
And so, um, what an ending! Classic Francis. <laughs> but no, I'm just going to say, my mind needed to be brought into alignment with the reality of my body, whereas, as opposed to the other way, as right? opposed to a body that needs to be brought into alignment of the reality of your mind. And uh, the Bible is very sceptical of our feelings as being the true north. So in our society, we're like, your feelings mm. and your self sense of identity is yeah. like the main thing. Whereas the Bible is like, says the exact opposite. It says that the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. And it can, you know, who can understand it? And that, that, is, why <laughs> that is why it must be cancelled. Yeah. Now, uh, so uh, it's great to have you on the show. Uh, please keep up the amazing work you're doing, obviously. But... Uh, as any guest on the show, you have uh, one final question on before we go to locals, which Blip. is, of course, what is the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? Mm. I think the whole trans thing is a microcosm of a much broader problem. So, you know, you, I was saying about just a failure to... Bring, your, bring the truth and reality into alignment with the way you want things to be, or the way you think sh things should be. So the whole problem of the the trans identifying, you know, movement is, I want my life to be like this. I really, um, it sh or it should be like this. Like as I say, when I was a feminist, it's like it should be like this. But reality always bites back. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're always going to be at odds, like with reality, and you're never going to find peace while you're trying to live outside it. I mean, we've got a whole world and social media telling you, you can, you can, you can, you can. Well, you can't. And, you know, the many detransition is a testament to that and the people who've been betrayed by that. But I think it's a microcosm of a broader human problem. So like, I think, again, like what I was saying about the us taking puberty blockers like over the last best part of a century um and peter hitchens writes about this brilliantly in um the rage against god brilliant book he talks about how how have we gone from being this kind of country with its massive christian heritage and then suddenly like all of the institutions and all of things in society and that's all just fallen away and he sort of charts brilliantly like certain events that happened during the, the last century that really kind of uh it's it's kind of like you you know what you were saying in your thread about how people lost trust in it um in institutions the same thing happened with christianity over the course of uh you know a few decades you know with the wars and the suez crisis and the female affair and all these different mm -hmm. things um so the point is i think we we said around the 60s, given some of these crises, I think the world should be like this and I don't like the reality of the way the world is and I'm going to live in accordance with that. And then you see the sexual, re sexual revolution, obviously, which we've covered with brilliant people like Louise Perry and Mary Harrington just doing such a brilliant job. Of and Mary Eberstadt mm. too. Yeah, Mary Eberstadt, yeah. Um, top level Crizo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah, lo loads of people um, have been writing about this now, which is, again, they tried the trans experiment. It was so extreme. It's failing. It's crumbling. I think what we're seeing now is what's happening in the wake of that last best part of a century of just let's do things our way. Let's completely reject God and the way he says that things, that life should be ordered in accordance with thriving. Let's say that, you know, let's throw out marriage. Let's throw out um, people taking responsibility for children. Let's take, let's throw out, um, you know, sex is just, you know, it's just a pleasure activity at the end of the day. And we should be able to have that. And placing that as the highest good in society, the highest value is like freedom and sexual, you know, fulfillment. And then the repercussions of that, you know, downstream are massive in terms of like, um, you know, people, women's unhappiness in terms of the dating market, trying to have sex like like men, as it were, in terms of no strings attached and, and, and you know, trying to be this empowered sexual being. And they don't, inside a lot of them, 
don't want that. They want to be with a man who's committed to them and have a relationship and have children and build a family and build a little home and a community. That's what most women want. And I think probably a lot of men want as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got, you know, the, the other downstream consequences, which are really sad, like the uh, like abortion. And just like, if you, if you say the highest value in society is that I should be able to have sex, whomever I want, and, you know, that's the most, that's the highest priority, that's the highest value, then, you know, the, it's almost like obligatory then that, a child's life should be sacrificed because of that, because it's like, well, that's that's my right. That's the most important thing. It comes before responsibility and anything else. So we're seeing all these, uh, you know, repercussions come out of it. Um, and I've got, I'm sure that many people will disagree with me, and, and that's fine. I don't mind talking and debating with anyone. But what I'm saying is we tried an experiment of rejecting God, I think, and rejecting, you know, the, the, the inheritance of Christianity that had been brought down over hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think that's failing in many ways. But again, in the same way, I'm encouraged about the the trans th- thing failing. I think I've seen a lot of people interested in Christianity again. And I think that we've seen a lot of people talking about it more freely and more openly. And I think a lot of people um, interested in pursuing it in a way that they weren't before. And I've seen a lot of people coming to Christ who have a completely no background in it whatsoever. Um, and uh, I think uh, if you'll if you'll uh, permit me to have one more minute, <laughs> um, the so I talked about the trans thing as a microcosm of like what's happened over the last century. I think that is a microcosm of the human experience, the human problem, which is um, you know if you if you want to look at history, if you want to look at the Old Testament, the if you don't know what the Old Testament is <laughs> in the Bible, pretty much the story of the old uh, the Old Testament is. Um, God tells, gives people like says this is what you know this is what's good and right and everyone's like yeah let's do it and then after a while they're like actually you know, we're not going to do that they start doing their own thing uh, everything goes wrong they repent and turn back to God and the cycle goes on and on and on that's like the human problem and I think that we're seeing that come around again there you go Sodom and yeah. Gomorrah is coming <laughs> but it's going to be fine after that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> If you Indeed. give your life to Christ. <laughs> oh, that looked terrifying. Oh, oh. Anyway, uh, Sophie Spittle, thank you so much. Do you want people to follow you online? Or do yeah, you, yeah, follow wh- me online. Where should they do that? Um, just Twitter, um, probably. Um, you need to tell them. The cesspit, where- yeah. Sophie Spittle, uh, S-P-I-T-A-L, like hospital without the ho. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, follow us on Locals where we will continue the conversation. Also, i got a substack in it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Lemming Jr. asks, uh, is there anything which can persuade autistic people that transitioning isn't the answer? 